Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Want to welcome to the program Robert P. Jones, President and Founder of Public Religion, uh, the Public Religion Research Institute, author of The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future. Uh, Robert, welcome to the program. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Um, and, uh, we say this is your, uh, I think your third book, and this is, um, uh, I don't know if it's actually a trilogy, uh, per se, but the, the issues that you deal with, um, uh, center around this. Uh, I found this one really fascinating, not the least of which, because, um, uh, we did an interview, uh, uh for, I think, Indigenous Peoples Day with Peter DeErico, who is a, uh, uh, professor emeritus from UMass, also a, um, uh, an Indian, uh, a lawyer who practices Indian law. And that was the first time I had heard about this doctrine of discovery, which, um, is really, I mean, a fundamental to your, your, your treaties that we, the start of white supremacy predates slavery in this country, at least, you know, chattel slavery and, and, uh, 1619. Uh, uh, tell us about that. No, that's right. Um, so, yeah, this word, the doctrine of discovery that you mentioned, I, I think is a term that many of us don't know. In fact, if you had asked me about this, you know, five years ago, I wouldn't, I would have stared at you fairly blankly. Um, and I'm someone, I've got a PhD in religion, had all kinds of, you know, American history courses uh, throughout my education, yet it was not something that was taught to me, not something that registered to me. Um, but as you say, it is the thing that really explains um, the moral compass um, that Europeans really brought with them and when they landed on these shores, of, of not just of the United States, what we now know as the United States, but the Americas, um, you know, written more, uh, more broadly. But, uh, but in brief, uh, essentially what happened was, right, with the quote-unquote discovery of these lands that Europeans did not know existed and people uh, that Europeans did not know existed, it created a moral and kind of theological crisis. Uh, and the real question was, well, what rights do these people have uh, that Europeans are bound to respect? Uh, and so they looked to um, uh, the, the closest thing to international law that existed at that time for the answer to that question, and that was the Christian church uh, in Europe. Um, and at that time, it was all, uh, it was before the Protestant Catholic split, so it was, it was the Roman Catholic Church and the head of the church uh, in the Vatican, the Pope, uh, in Rome, and they began to develop this doctrine called the Doctrine of Discovery, and it essentially, um, you know, there's a lot of theologic, theological apparatus, but it essentially boiled down to this. Um, to answer the question uh, about whether these people had, you know, basic human rights that Europeans were bound to uh, respect, uh, they answered that question with a question. And the question was, well, are they Christian? And, of course, they knew the answer to that question. And, and if the answer was no, they went on to spell out then that Europeans, because of their, quote, unquote, superior um, not only a kind of ethnic uh, uh, identity, but superior religion had the right then to occupy those lands, to steal their goods, and the documents actually spell it out uh, in black and white, like, you know, this is a direct quote, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, right? And that is from the head of the church um, there, and that, that really is what sets the moral compass for the first European contact um, with indigenous people uh, that ultimately also carries over into the transatlantic slave trade. And so we should just be clear, we're talking about, you know, uh, the uh, the 1400s, you know, ranging, I think there was a document yep. in 1452, and then one in uh, the fourteen early 1490s, um, and it's Pope Alexander VI um, who uh, creates this doctrine, and, um, and, and the, I mean, the, the really shocking thing about this doctrine to me, I mean, because, you know, we had divine rights of kings, and of the sort of these type of doctrines that, you know, were created uh, in this era, this one has been incredibly durable to the point where it is embedded in U.S. constitutional law has been referenced. We're not talking just back in like the 1820s. Mm. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, without, I think, saying the words. I mean, this is what the amazing thing yeah. was that I is that. This doctrine is referenced maybe through its case law, but the original case law referenced the doctrine of discovery, and it is the fundamental principle that we use in Indian law today in this country. Will you walk us through that a little bit? Because I think uh, 
the 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 idea that you're showing is that this strain of thinking, this dynamic, exists through uh, our country from its pre-founding, and um, and to see it so embedded with you know even the liberal icon on the Supreme Court, mm-hmm. I think it really uh, illustrates that point. No, that's exactly right. So it may sound kind of quaint, right? We say, okay, well, this was, you know, these were doctrines in the church from 1452 to 1493. Uh, you know, that's a long time ago. So how does this really affect us today? Um, and I should say that, that that year 1493 is the one that's really particular to the Americas, because that's when Columbus actually goes back, all right, and says, I, I really want a specific moral mandate for, one of, for the whole colonial settler project. And that's when he gets this uh, additional edict uh, from the Pope in 1493, but but it does carry through, and, and so you, if you think about it, it is the basic claim uh, that again that Europeans, uh, both in terms of their the, the terms you hear all the time, are in terms of their civilization and their religion, are superior uh, to the indigenous people here. They're superior to Africans uh, by using that, that phrase, uh, civilization and Christianity, show up over and over again. Uh, and as you say, it gets embedded not just in our kind of moral consciousness and in our culture and our, our churches, but it gets embedded in U.S. law. So, um, you know, it, the, the kind of main document um, is in the 1820s, um, uh, Johnson v. McIntosh, uh, where this just gets spelled out, and it uses that language. The, uh, in the case law, it says, you know, the superior genius of Europe uh, it, by, and uh, justified the taking of these lands, and in exchange, they were given, the, the indigenous people were given civilization, and Christianity, that was the bargain. And that would seem to be a just bargain. And that's the thing that really sets U.S. case law. And you're right, you know, in the 2000, early 2000s, Ruth Bader Ginsburg cites footnote number one uh, back to this case law uh, that goes all the way back to this idea. And we should say, I mean, that is uh, that case was uh, Cheryl, um, uh, the city of Cheryl versus the uh, Oneonta uh, nation of New York. Um Folks can go back and listen to the the Erico uh, interview to to sort of like hear this um, uh, how this doctrine travels, you know, to our present day um, regarding um, uh, Indian law. In fact, there was a case I think a year ago that he that uh, supposedly was received uh, well um, uh, by uh, advocates of indigenous people, but again maintained this doctrine. Uh, in a way that just the the outcome uh, 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 worked out. But uh, let's turn to your book because w- with that understanding that this is the dynamic um, that uh, there is this uh, sort of like doctrine of white <laughs> of white Christian supremacy um, that fundamentally established the uh, uh, the dyna- the the fundamental dynamic. You trace this the way that it moves through indigenous uh, our relations with indi- indigenous people as a country to uh into chattel slavery um uh, uh, walk us through that i mean you chose three separate uh i guess counties or uh, um, uh to, to look at the first is uh tallahatchie county uh in uh mississippi in the the uh, why why there yeah well you know I- I think it's what I'm trying to do. I think is to, to just have a step back and to kind of widen the aperture for how we think about American history, both as in the nation and even at the local level. So, you know, I think it's so important what the work that the 1619 project did, right? Sort of backing us up. Uh, cause, cause in, in many ways, this is about our origin stories. Who are we? How do we get here? These big questions, uh, about American identity that are roiling, you know, the country. And the 1619 project was so important because it pulled us away from this very narrow view of 1776, right? And these, you know, one image, uh, you know, that kind of famous painting that gets on the postage stamp of these white dudes in Philadelphia with their quill pens and their colonial finery, like that's the beginning of America, right? And so 1619 Project backs it up. Um, but I think even there, um, the, inter- the European interactions with Native Americans are still, are more than a century old by the time 1619. Uh, holds around. So I think kind of pulling it back. And then I tried to make this concrete by going to local levels, right? So uh, uh, I'm from Mississippi. So one of the, the places that I picked was um, to, to kind of illustrate how this goes all the way down the ground was Tallahatchie County, Mississippi. This is a county up in the Mississippi Delta. Um, it is the um, the county where uh, Emmett Till was killed and where his 
trial was um, in 1955, uh, and where his killers were acquitted after just over an hour of the jury um, uh, deliberating, and then later confessed, of course, to the murder, and no justice was ever done there. Um, so, I, but you know, if, if we think about that, I, I'm trying to kind of hold these two histories together that we usually keep separate. So, African American history on the one hand, Native American history um, on the other. Uh, and I have a sentence in the book I think gives you the spirit of it, where I said, you know, Emmett Till was born in 1941, um, but his uh, his story actually begins 500 years earlier, um, uh, in 1451, uh, when Hernando de Soto. Uh, actually shows up and quote unquote, you know, claims, uh, uh, Spain discovers, uh, the Mississippi River and claims it, uh, for Spain. Uh, you know, and, and that trajectory to understand the, the full sweep of how we got to where we are and really to fully understand how do we get to a society where the killing and torture and killing of a 14 year old boy for allegedly whistling at a woman, uh, at a, at a corner store, um, uh, results, you know, in his, in his death and, and, and that the killers go free. Like, how do we get to a society where that's okay and that this, this kind of injustice can be done? And to really answer that question, I'm saying we have to really go all the way back and not only include that, but what happened before in, uh, slavery, and that is the forced removal of uh, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creek uh, indigenous people from those lands that later became uh, the lands we think about, um, the kind of antebellum lands where enslavement of other peoples was so rampant. How how applicable is this to understanding also the manifest destiny as this being kind of the ideological, uh, you know, great grandfather of manifest destiny? That's a great question. And we talked about the way that this works itself up through, um, you know, the ligaments of law, uh, but it also kind of has connected tissue in our culture. Uh, so that's, a, I think, one of the best examples, this idea of manifest destiny, right? It's a, you know, it has kind of theological roots to it. Well, uh, destiny, right, providence uh, is, is very connected to that idea. So that, you know, there is this idea that uh, it was just foreordained that this country would spread from ocean to ocean. And that, that idea that it was inevitable uh, and even more powerfully that it was providential, uh, that uh, that this will go from ocean to ocean. That's directly tied uh, to this idea that these, you know, kind of make it very plain, uh, this idea from the Doctrine of Discovery that these lands were destined by God uh, to be a kind of promised land for European Americans, and that's what they're for. And so that that's fueled e- even things like a city set on a hill, manifest destiny, all of those these ideas, um, kind of pick up their their real um, strength and their moral claims uh, from the doctor of discovery. Do you um, uh, do you have a sense of how the that we? I mean, because so much of the American project, right, was at least presumably a a, 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 a the next step in the democratization of of the way that governments exist so um you're no longer a king sitting we no longer have a king who is sitting there by divine right and we uh as a society i mean uh, you know with all the caveats about the imperfection of our existing democracy and the way it was set up uh you know for an aristocracy at that time etc cetera, etc cetera, it was it did become untethered from the religious you know god essentially saying this is the ruler and that's where my power comes from it's god to the how did this like we can you talk about how that dynamic yeah how, how this white supremacy dynamic exists sort of shed from the religious connotations because i think it explains so much of our politics broadly speaking both the white supremacy elements But other, the patriarchy, all of these things um, seem to have been founded in um, uh, a Christian thought and and religious thought more broadly, perhaps. Um, But now sort of get laundered into our society without that element. No, I love this question. I mean, the the way that I think about it is, you know, you're right. I mean, there was this great achievement of moving away from the divine right of kings, right, to rule by the people to democracy, um, trying to bring that into the kind of modern world. And, and that's like so important, right? And something I think as Americans to be proud of. But 
it didn't come that way cleanly. Uh, and, and in many ways, what happened was we ended up with, we kind of just displaced a divine right of kings to a divine right of European rule, right? So even though it was ruled by, because if you remember, right, the Constitution, uh, it's not for everybody, right? It's for your men who are of European descent who own property, right? That's who, uh, these are, you know, that's who it transferred from a divine right of kings to the divine right of this elite aristocracy, really. Um, and that's been broadened over our history. I think that's really important as well. But I think it's worth remembering the contradictions that we brought with it, even as we were broadening, moving away from divine right of kings, trying to broaden it. Uh, but, you know, it, and again, it's in the, you know, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, uh, among the complaints, right, that the white male colonists are making back to the King of England, uh, they mention uh, they call Native Americans merciless savages in the Declaration of Independence, uh, and they're complaining uh, that the king is um, uh, supporting slave rebellions uh, among them, right? So this white supremacy, white Christian supremacy is still built even into the complaints that are leveling against the King of England in the Declaration of Independence, and of course, even in the Constitution, um, again, it's, it's, you know, women are including those rights. It explicitly in- excludes Indians. Uh, and that's the word, you know, excluding Indians uh, is actually in the uh, in the Constitution. It only counted um, Af- people of African descent, uh, right, as three-fifths of a person, and then only to accrue to the to the power of white men, uh, not not to themselves. So, I think the power of telling the story uh, and kind of backing up and seeing uh, this uh, connected tissue and seeing the story this way is to see. That yes, like these are great achievements, um, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, democracy, but they 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 came with them, built into them contradictions, right? That we're still kind of weeding out. Well, I I, I don't want to oppress it, belabor this too much, but it feels like on some level, um, the 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 God juice, right? That gave that gave you the the sort of the power to be king was sort of transferred when we got to this country to um, to money or really more specifically property. Because when we talk about all of this, the, the notion of property rights uh, and the accumulation of property and the accumulation of wealth are built into all of this, right? It's like a chattel slavery. It is we're taking these lands ultimately to produce more uh, wealth. Um, women can't own their own property uh they are in fact property of their husband it all like sort of centers around this sort of like a property juice if you will and the system is set up so that only one particular type of person has access to this property but because they have and and we still see that today uh, it seems to me on the right property values sort of exist like god exists you know at one point we decide it's there and then that's property rights are inalienable yeah I, the one thing i'd say back to that is i think you know what i'm interested in is um how do you make such an audacious claim right that here we are we're coming over from europe we're going to land on these shores and then all of this land now belongs to us right um how do we make that and and that we can harness uh enslave people's labor and accrue all that wealth to us. I mean, these are wild, right, audacious claims to be making. And so the way you make those uh, and the way you justify them is that you attach them to a religious claim, right? And ultimately what you claim is this is the way that God has designed the world. Uh, that is the ultimate, right, and in, in kind of moral justification. If you can assert uh, that, look, you know, um, we didn't make the rules. God made the rules, and God set up these hierarchies this way, uh, and we just happen to be at the top of the pyramid. Uh, but, you know, it's not us. Uh, it's God, if you want to take, take it up. And, in fact, that's the, that's the way that um, anti-abolitionist arguments went uh, in the U.S., um, you know, made exactly those kinds of claims. And it's exactly what the documents do that um, uh, displace Native Americans um, uh, and, and, and make claims to those lands. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, you also, uh, look at, uh, Duluth, Minnesota and, um, the, um, the, uh, you, you start with this sort of juxtaposition of, 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 of escaped slaves, I guess, and, um, uh, Native Americans, 
who were um, being dispossessed. Um, uh, tell us about that and what that uh, tells us, mm. what, what, why that story sort of like uh, illustrates this point more too. Yeah, well, I, I opened the whole book, as you know, with that with that story from Minnesota. And, and I should say, you know, I, I didn't want to write, so I've got three states, so Mississippi and Oklahoma and Minnesota, that I use as case studies for the book. And I didn't want to just, you know, pick on states that were in the deep south uh, or very conservative states politically today, like Oklahoma. Um, uh, but I wanted to kind of make the point, this was really an American story. I could have written 50 chapters or one for each state easily and told stories like this of indigenous removal, genocide, and enslavement, um, uh, and kind of settler colonialism. But in Minnesota, um, I, you know, I began this, this story because these worlds actually collide and you can see this history intertwined in one story. And just briefly, um, uh, there is, uh, uh enslaved man named Robert Hickman, uh, who uh, is literate? He's, he's actually a, a, a preacher, and he he gets word of the of uh, the Emancipation uh, Proclamation, and he's in Missouri, so it doesn't apply to him in Missouri because it's a, it's not um, a, a, a state in rebellion, uh, which is what the Emancipation only uh, restricted itself to. But nonetheless, he takes the opportunity uh, to set out and to free his family and, and neighbors, and they push out on a raft, hoping to get picked up. Uh, by a Union steamer, uh, which they do. Uh, they tow them up uh, uh, to Fort Snelling uh, outside of the Minneapolis-St. Paul uh, uh, area, and, um, and they disembark there. And what's remarkable is that as they're disembarking, right, kind of reaching their freedom uh, uh, from enslavement, they encounter this group uh, of um, hundreds and hundreds of uh, Dakota uh, people who've been rounded up uh, the previous year, and are are they are in fact uh, on their way to be exiled, shipped out of uh, Minnesota um, uh, in the wake of uh, of clashes between the Dakota people and the federal government um, over treaty obligations that the federal government was uh, guilty of of, of not honoring. Uh, but uh, sent in, you know, the cavalry defeated people and then rounded them up, kept them in a um, miserable encampment all winter, and then were waiting for the spring thaw to ship them and exiled them from the state. And so you have this kind of very poignant uh, example of, on the one hand, uh, formerly enslaved people finding their freedom and the last vestiges of sovereignty of the Dakota people in Minnesota all at the same time. Uh, and I think what's uh, behind that too is that um, just previously, uh, there had been uh, in that area the, the largest mass execution uh, that the federal government has ever presided over. I mean, it was 38 Dakota men uh, who were hung on the same day uh, for their part in, in the uprising there. And also, I think the thing that kind of holds these, you know, co this complex history of ours together is that these two documents, um, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and uh, uh, the documents that were going to sign the fate of these uh, 38 Dakota men were on the desk of Abraham Lincoln at the same time, and he signed off on both. Uh, it's fascinating history. And, um, uh, and then you also uh, get into um, uh, the, the. I mean, I think, you know, folks on this program are familiar with the uh, Oklahoma uh, race massacres and, mm -hmm. and the Tulsa, the, and, 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 and frankly, the, uh, I mean, the many of them that were happening at this time. But the, um, the idea that the Trail of Tears uh, and the Indian Removal Act was, um, largely a function of plantation owners in Georgia wanting uh, more fertile land and, uh, and, and, and Georgia and uh, Alabama and, um, and then basically sending uh, these uh, uh, people ultimately to the extent that they uh, live to, to Oklahoma. Um, wh where, I mean, is it, is it just the sort of, the coincidence of those two things happening, uh, you know, uh, around Oklahoma, or is there is there a, a, di a direct or indirect lineage there? Well, it was remarkable. You know, I didn't really kind of pull all this together until I was deep in the research for the book. Um, but that, yeah, these two things are happening exactly the same time. I, I was just actually in Tulsa last week, and I. I intentionally waited to see the movie Killers of the Flower Moon until I was in Tulsa. And I watched it at an old theater that was built in the 1920s in Tulsa while all this was happening. 
Uh, and I think to make the, again, to make the connections, like we learned about um, the Tulsa Wraith Massacre, um, but it didn't get connected for the most part in the public conversations to what was known as the Reign of Terror among the Osage. And that was happening just 60 miles away, just up the road uh, from Tulsa at the same time, uh, right? And so these were absolutely connected events. On the one hand, uh, you've got, um, and you can see the connective tissue, right? It's about power. It's about um, uh, not uh, about uh, seeing wealth by anyone non-white as illegitimate, mm. uh, property ownership uh, as illegitimate. So, you know, at the same time, the Osage, uh, just briefly, were being, um, you know, who ended up being, got pushed around several times, ended up on land that white people thought were worthless until it turned out there was oil uh, under that land and became fabulously wealthy uh, because of that. And then white people turned out to, um, you know, start uh, this campaign to poison people, to marry into families, to inherit the head rights. It was a really ugly, ugly history. But that's happening right down the road uh, from the Tulsa Race Massacre, where, you know, white roving bands of white people um, kind of over a period of a couple of days, um, you know, murdered over 300 African-Americans and burned down the entire section of Greenwood. Uh, but it's all, I think, motivated by this, um, again, this idea of, like, who are the legitimate inheritors of the land, right, is white European people. I just put one little kind of period on this. Uh, you know, I actually dug up sermons uh, that were preached in Tulsa uh, the Sunday after the Tulsa Race Massacre. And you could see the Doctrine of Discovery just rearing its head there, where uh, they essentially pretty uniformly blamed uh, the African-American uh, people for um, uh, for the violence and just denied any culpability among uh, white people um, uh, uh, there in Tulsa. Um, I, I want to get to sort of the, um, your, I guess, uh, prescription uh, to the extent that there is one. But before we do, and this may be, you know, somewhat outside of, uh, of your portfolio, but I'm curious because, you know, one of the things that, and, and obviously, you know, there's a lot going on um, uh, right now uh, in Gaza and that is, you know, sort of the, Many of, of today's sort of like uh, events are, you know, sort of at least in the context of my mind, you know, filtering through that. And I think back to the to the, the Balfour Declaration mm. and uh, the idea that, um, you know, uh, Balfour certainly was um, uh, looking uh, uh, for a way to get the Jews out of at least of of, of England and thought, okay, uh, this might be a good location. That's back in 1917. Obviously, the uh, Israel is not um, uh, founded until uh, 40 some odd years later. Um, but I'm curious about the sort of ability for um, white supremacy to be sort of like bequeathed. Because the dynamic of, you know, even in the Balfour Declaration, it said you need to uh, respect the rights of the people living there. And uh, certainly at that time, uh, Jews were a significant minority, um, 1800s through the 1900s, really, until the last decade. I mean, they were, they were still a minority in the last decade before the founding of Israel, but like a significant, like single digits uh, minority. But this idea of like, we don't like you, but you're close enough to us that we're going to give you the sort of the magic ticket, which allows you to dispossess the people who are even a lot, le lot less like us. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, it's not my field, so I'm going to be very uh, kind of narrow in my response here. The one thing I would point to, that there is a direct connection, um, actually, uh, uh, to um, Jewish people in this kind of doctrine and discovery conversation we've been talking about. It's a little different than what you're talking about. The one thing I would point to is that the other thing that's happening in 1493 and in those areas around there, as these papal edicts are coming about, is that locally in Europe, so that, uh, we've been talking about how they're getting used across the Atlantic and the Americas, but locally in Europe, these same edicts, um, right, the term that got used for um, basically, again, that kind of qualifying question, are they Christian? Um, and, and if the answer was no, uh, the, the, the term that got used was they are to be considered enemies of Christ, like that kind of very bellicose term. Uh, and that term got applied to Muslims, to Jews, uh, to not just to sort of indigenous people or African peoples, but to Muslims and Jews as well, that justified like, 
the expulsion of Jews from the Iberian Peninsula uh, in the 15th century as well. So, like, this is kind of goes all the way back, and it's it's a lot more complicated in the 20th century. Um, I, I think with the kind of you know this idea of Judeo-Christian uh, kind of amalgamation that we get in the 20th century, but uh, I think even when you hear that term, uh, it's not always uh, as solidarity laden as one might think um, when you hear that term. Well, we, uh, we've seen today. in this country yeah. the sort of like uh, growing, um, you know, who gets to be white has evolved yeah. over the course of uh, you know, particularly right. in the 20th century. Um, and you know, uh, that dynamic as it suits, uh, you know, various people, you gotta deal with the Ottoman empire. I got a twofer here. I can get the, I can get the Jews out, but also still have a connection, uh, mm. that will help us, uh, you know, uh, uh, deal with sort of like, uh, our rivals that are growing in the region. Um, but let's talk about, you know, the, to the extent that there is a path, <laughs> out of this dynamic um uh, uh talk about uh, what your ideas are in that respect yeah well uh you you know and all of your listeners should be relieved to know that there is no 12-step plan uh, <laughs> at the end of the book um everyone should be suspicious if there if there was one um you know this is a multi-century problem um that we've been dealing with and these contradictions are but i still think you know that you know, we see it. We're going to see it over and over um, again in our politics over the next 12 months. Um, we saw it in the. In, I think this ring its head in the election of uh, Mike Johnson uh, last week, right, um, as, as Speaker of the House. I mean, he is the embodiment. Um, I, I, you know, I wrote a, a piece last week called him the embodiment of Christian nationalism in a tailored suit. Um, you know, that that's I think in many ways what he represents. Uh, but this this deep. Uh, you know, whenever we hear our politics dividing along these lines, and that is like. Are we, you know, a pluralistic democracy where everyone stands on equal footing before the Constitution and the law, or are we this other vision? Uh, are we a divinely ordained promised land for European Christians? Is that really who America is? Are we? Is that the claim that we're hearing uh, uh, being made? And we hear that claim, I think, from Mike Johnson and others uh, uh, in today. Right? This is not a 500-year-old problem; it's still with us uh, today. But I think on the on the, um, the hopeful side, I mean, the second part of the uh, title is and the path of shared American future. You know, when I find some hope, I think is on the ground. Uh, and the other thing I did is in each of these communities we've been talking about, Texas, Oklahoma, Minnesota, um, I kind of hung out with folks on the ground that have been doing the hard work of reckoning with this history, telling the truth, uh, and doing it in a way that is laying a foundation for a better and different future um, across lines of race and religion and, and laying the ground groundwork for a pluralistic uh, democracy. Uh, just one quick example from Mississippi. Um, you know, this this is a it's a very rural county. It's a very poor county. Not a lot of uh, resources there. And yet, a dozen or so uh, folks got together a few decades ago and said, you know what, we need to tell the truth about what happened here in Tallahatchie County, and we're gonna we need to issue an apology to the Till family, which had never been done. Uh, there were no historical markers uh, in the in the uh, county that it happened, even though Till's story was known all over the world. On the ground there in Tallahatchie County, there was virtually nothing, uh, and they began to do that work um, uh, and uh, issued this apology to the Till family, and then kept working. There's now markers all over um, telling this story, and I think uh, this is not in the book because it, it just happened this summer. Um, it resulted in a new national monument that that, that uh, President Joe Biden and and, uh, and Vice President Kamala Harris just announced the uh, um, uh, creation of the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley. Uh, national monument that'll be jointly held uh, in Tallahatchie County, Mississippi, and Chicago. Uh, that'll be administered by the National Park Service, right? So I think this story now from this group of you know intrepid group of black and white descendants of enslavers and descendants of the enslaved uh, came together uh, to tell the story and to try to you know, make some healing, uh, uh, build some healing in, the, in their um, in their local community that's had national consequences. So I think if I find some hope. Um, you know, that's where I'm finding it to seeing this work on the ground. Well, uh, it's a, um, uh, fascinating, uh, look into these, uh, to, um, obviously to the, 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 I guess the, uh, fundamental sort of like building blocks of white supremacy, or at least where the, how it's rationalized. Um, uh, Robert P. Jones, uh, president, founder, public religion research Institute, the book, the Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future. 
We'll put a link to that at majority.fm and in the podcast and YouTube description. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Great conversation. Thank you.